How, so how long? So how long have you been in, in um, gyms for? I believe we started. So uh, we went live first of June. Mm. So yeah, just over just over a year, really. Just over a year in business. That's a pretty good milestone of twelve months to sort of catch up and see how you're going. And obviously during this sort of time as well. So how how have you been finding things overall? Uh, as far as the business goes, or yeah, as far as the business goes, yeah. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, no, I'm mm. loving it. Um, it's going really well. Um, it was a little bit tough in the beginning, trying to get a little bit focused on how to um, approach the business and how to get it off its feet um, to get up and running. But I think once uh, I, I think once you just get focused on where you want to go and what you want to achieve and make positive steps to keep moving forward with that, it's it's not too bad. It's pretty self-explanatory, really. There's only one way to be successful in a business, and that's to um, to go for it, really. And what were we doing so, prior? finding the tools, yeah. you know, what tools there are to go for it, really. So, yeah, it's been good support through gyms and um, through my franchisor and, uh, yeah, also with the other boys helping out in the beginning. You know, if you're not too sure about something and you want some training or some help with something, yeah, it's been really good. And what were you doing prior, Kevin, to gyms? Um, so prior to gyms, just prior to gyms, I was actually a truck driver in the mines. And um, prior to that, uh, a dairy farmer. So a dairy farmer. Oh yeah, I come from Warrnambool, so we a lot of dairy farms in yeah. Southwest Victoria. So yeah. So I mean, I moved over here from New Zealand um, twelve years ago. So in New Zealand, I was a dairy farmer, and then came over here and drove some trucks through the countryside, had a good look around, and um, yeah, truck driving's pretty dangerous sport. So I uh, thought it might be something. Try and, and do we- something. To stay home. And were you from a family dairy farm or were you just a milker on a farm? Or? Um, I started off, my parents owned a dairy farm and then I went off as a young fella and worked for people. And then I got right up to being a lower order shear milker. So basically running the farm and employing staff and everything else. Mm. Um, and yeah, and then I came over here. So Fantastic. Mm. Well, a lot of good, look, I'm a country boy as well, mate. So no wonder you're successful in doing what you're doing <laughs> with that work ethic. <laughs> Getting up you've early. Got, you've yeah. got to wear that's for sure. That's it. So so how did you come about Jim's turbine and pest control? Because you come from a completely unrelated industry, being truck driving, being previously a dairy farmer. So why Jim's turbine and pest control? How did you come about the opportunity or why did you sort of throw yourself in that one? Um, I suppose it came down to, uh, I nearly lost my life a couple of times in the mines driving trucks. Um, so I had a couple of really close calls there. Um, then it came down to really trying to work out um, what was going to be a good return on income? Uh, I didn't have a trade. Uh, I don't have a trade as such. Uh, dairy farming is not considered a trade anyway. Um, well, it is, but not a qualification. So it was about trying to work out how to how to have a good, decent income, um, turn over some money, and you know, without having an apprenticeship or or a four year trade behind you, what what type of industry was going to draw uh, create enough income for that. So um, then I looked into uh, a private pest control business in Mandra because uh, I th- so years ago I had a, just stepping back a little bit, going back a little bit, years ago I had a, a guy come round and he pulled into my driveway, backed into my driveway with a BMW X5 and he said, I've come to give you a free termite inspection. And uh, so, oh, okay, this is great. Had no idea about the industry or anything else. And, so he grabbed a screwdriver out of his BMW X5 and stuck a hole in a tree stump in the front garden and threw his hands up in the air and said, oh my God, oh my God, I've never seen such an infestation. <laughs> uh, so then he went out to my backyard and he did the same thing again. And and so I was like, okay, here we go. And so I said to him, well, what's that going to cost to fix that problem? And he said, oh, just give me $3,000 and I'll fix it. So um, that really stuck with me. Um, I sort of thought that was the dodgiest thing I'd ever seen really in my whole life. So I kind of said to him, well, you grab your screwdriver and get back in your BMW and off you go, mate. Um, and then, yeah, I think that kind of sat in the back of my mind for quite a while. Uh, and then this, like I said, I nearly lost my life in, in the mines. I got really, really sick. Um, I, I don't think it, well, they're saying now that it could have been a COVID strain last year, but I, I got really sick. Uh, for six months, I was really, really sick. 
Um, mm. And so then I just sort of that came up again and I thought, hey, if a guy like that can make $3,000 with an effort like that, then there must be room for having somebody who's actually fully trained and, um, you know, being genuine with their customers and putting, you know, a good effort in for a good result. So, yeah, I looked into a private business here in Mandra um, and the guy was selling his business, his vehicle, his, his database, the computer, the whole package for $35,000, I think it was. And then we sort of started pulling it apart and having a look at what we would have to do to uh, make that business our own. And by the time we changed the name, by the time we changed the phone number, by the time we replaced the vehicle, um, by the time we did everything to that business to make it our own, there was nothing left. Um, so it didn't seem feasible to take that business on. And that's when, uh, when I approached Marnie, or I guess, yeah, when I started looking into franchises. Mm. That's a very, you said some really great points there, Kevin, in your analysis of, of what you're doing. What a lot of people probably now during the time would be looking at as well. You know, something where, what's something where if, you know, you don't have the time to go and do a trade, maybe at that stage in life and you want to earn something that's really good money and you want to throw yourself into it and you came across the opportunity, which was great. Now you use that as your vehicle to, to, to build a self a good business. So what was the actual training itself like? Cause that's always a bit of a, a thing for people. They're a bit unsure. As you said, you're going from this truck driving industry to termite and pest control, you know, we, the training process and the period, how was that for you? Um, in the beginning, it was, uh, it was, it's quite difficult because obviously with pest control, there's 13 units that need to be done through TAFE. Um, because of where I started in, in, that, in that system in TAFE, I had um, unit eight and 10, six, eight and 10 to catch up on uh, to complete and unit four was well underway. So I got landed with, um, with four units straight away um, and you only have three months to complete each unit from the date they're handed out. So basically I got given four units to be completed in three months instead of one unit. Um, then it was not only learning the business, but it was setting up the business, um, you know, setting up all the programs, gyms, formatize, all of that. And then it was learning how to do the job as well. Um, so there was training with my franchisor, um, that was a 30 day one-on-one -on -one training. Um, and between my franchisor and the TAFE lecturer, um, and just really wanting to learn was the big thing. Um, just going to TAFE and going with the franchisor and just absorbing everything, whether it be right or wrong or whether it's what you believe in or not, um, you don't have anything to compare it to. So it was just a case of really just absorbing everything like a sponge um, and doing a lot of late nights doing TAFE, uh, doing units. So yeah. how'd, you go back with, yeah, how'd you go back to the TAFE process? You must have that studying, studying again for some people later in life. It's yeah. How'd you go off that? Yeah. Um, it was, it was very difficult in the beginning. Uh, I'm not really uh, being a dairy farmer and a, and a country boy, I suppose. Um, I'm not really used to sitting at a desk and mm knuckling down on things like that but um it if you want to achieve something then you have to put put an effort in and i knew that sitting there looking at all of these um units and having a cry about it and uh you know not really hitting it was never going to get me anywhere so it was just really a case of just um digging in um and as i got as i got more into it and as i put more effort into the units and as i got more understanding through the the, the booklets and, and the paperwork that we got alongside those units, um, the interest took over, uh, which created uh, more enthusiasm to learn. And that in turn made the, made the paperwork side of it much easier for me as well. I was going to say, so you got more interested in, in it as you were doing it. You sort of get a bit of a passion that way, the more you threw yourself oh. into the learning and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was really important for me to do something that I wanted to continue to do that I wanted mm. to enjoy doing. Um, and I never really thought pest control was, you know, I've never really thought of it as being anything other than some blokes that come around and try and rob you really. Uh, <laughs> With a BMW uh, X5. I mean, you, you know, who hasn't got a $99 spider spray 
uh, that lasted maybe five minutes and they were there for five minutes and you went, well, that was totally overpriced and totally underwhelming. So um, that's pretty much people's general impression of pest control, or at least it has been in the past. Um, so to really try and lift that standard and that professionalism in, in a business that is considered to be, you know, along the lines of dodgy car dealers, um, is, has been really something that I wanted to, that I wanted to achieve in my business. Well, let's talk about that because you've got a lot of good five-star reviews and, and which many made us aware of and we did a post online. So let's talk about what your professionalism is compared to, let's say, other people in the industry, what you do differently. Um, all right. Well, I think the first thing is uh, you, have to, you have to listen to what your customer wants. So we get a lead, the lead comes up, you look at the lead and on that lead, it, it kind of explains briefly what the customer is after. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what the customer is after. So the big thing is to make that call, make that contact, um, you know, talk with a smile on your face, make, make, the, make the right connection straight away with the customer and then allow them to have some time to talk to you about what their needs are. And more often than not, you'll find that um, what you thought was their need was really not what they wanted. Um, but you need to take that time to listen to them. Use a couple of directing questions uh, to sort of get them in, you know, like they don't, they don't know anything about pest control. So they, they want to know where to start. So you ask them what their requirements are. Oh, well, I've got this, I've got that, I've got this, I've got that. And then you, so you ask them, all right, well, where are those problems in your home? Are they inside? Are they outside? And then they start to get the feel of, all right, they start to learn what you're looking for to help them sort their problem out. And from then onwards, it's kind of pretty much just a friendship conversation, really. I just get on well with my customers. Um, and then the, then that's, so that's the first level of professionalism is to be a, a combination of happy, um, friendly, but still professional. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I tend to, I don't know, I've always been a bit of a talker. My father was always a talker. You know, we just talk to anybody randomly in the street. I've not really got a problem talking to strangers. So um, being having good communication is definitely a, a, a good start for sure. And then taking that professionalism to the next level is when you get to their house. You know, there are things that you can do. You, you don't go and stand right in front of their front door when they open the door up. You knock on the door, take a step back. You know, you're looking good. <clears throat> you know, you're smelling good. You, you're ready for work. You're there. You know, and you've got a smile on your face. Um, and then, you know, giving that customer the rundown on what you're going to do, even whether you've done that on the phone already, explaining to them, pointing out areas, what you're going to treat, why you're going to treat it, and what the result is that they're going to get from that treatment. Um, and then going ahead and doing the job. Um, pest control is one of those things. It's not like the mowing franchise where... Um, a gym's guy will turn up out the front of your house and he'll mow your lawns and he'll cut your hedges. And when he leaves, the place looks fantastic. Um, pest control is a bit of, you can't really see what you're spending money on. So you've got a house, I come and spray your house for spiders. And when I sprayed the house, it still looks the same, but they've handed over money. So it's all about making a little bit of a visual impression on them as well. So, I mean, I've got a web brush. Um, I'll go and do the cobwebs before I spray the place. Um, or I'll, I'll sweep their paths, um, just tidy up the paths from the sand and the leaves and everything from the storm. Or I'll just try and change the appearance of their house somewhat so that when they, when they go outside, when you've left and they've seen, and they have a look around, because they always will, people just want to expect to see spiders dropping from everywhere. Um, <laughs> And so they'll go and have a look, you know, and if they can see a visual difference in what you've done, as well as some spiders dropping from everywhere, then um, you've made an impression on that person. Fantastic. Now let's talk about what does a typical day or typical week look like for you, Kevin, in, in, your, in your field of uh, service? Um, well, it used to be, it, in the beginning, it used to be uh, looking at the diary and working out, how much energy and how many hours I had to hand out flyers. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> so it was just flyers, flyers, yeah. flyers, flyers, just never stopped. Um, 
And then as work started to pick up, um, now we're at the moment, we're booked out until the end of the month, um, starting to put some jobs in for next month already. Um, and it's just about planning. But pest control is a big area. So, uh, I mean, we're signed on for about 100 k's in either direction from where we live. So when you get jobs coming, whether they be leads or whether they be pickups from past work that you've done or friendships or, or whatever that might be, it's about, uh, the first thing is about planning where you're gonna go. Um, because obviously we can't drive 100 k's in one direction and then drive 200 k's in the opposite direction, end up doing two jobs for the day. So um, planning where you're going, um, and what time you're going to be there and how long it's going to take you when you're there and how long it's going to take you to get to the next job. That's a big part of my day. Um, yeah. Or well, a big part of the day before, put it that way. Mm. So maximizing so your route and then doing local area marketing in the early day. And now, and with your business, sorry, Kevin, interrupt you. Is it, is it, do you have a lot of repeat clients? You say you have a lot of referrals and stuff like that? Yeah, we do. Um, I think, just off the top of my head, we've created, I think, uh, in just over 12 months, $88,000 in repeat customer work and pickups. Just in repeats. Just in repeats yeah. and pickups. Wow. Yeah. It's fantastic. So um, that is nearly, uh, I think it's fractionally under or fractionally, I think it's fractionally under 50% of our work. Wow, that's so, really, really good. Yeah. Um, you know, and... It helped. Uh, I don't. Not too sure if you're aware. We bought a second franchise. No, I'm not aware of that at all. So let's no, talk about so that. We we bought a second <laughs> franchise. Uh, obviously, Jim's Termite and Pest Control. Um, there was a Jim's Termite and Pest Control bloke here in uh, Mandra when we started, um, and I went and met him before we bought the franchise. Um, he probably wasn't the most positive guy in the business. Um, whether that be through his own reasons or whatever else. Um, but I worked well with him while he was, uh, while he was with Jim's and then he relinquished his business six months ago, I think. And so I took that opportunity to um, purchase that second, that second territory. Um, and the, the reason for that is uh, I live in a town with 60,000 population. Um, I want a business where I live. I want to step outside of my door and I want to work where I live. Uh, I don't want to drive to Perth every day. If I wanted to do that, I would continue driving a truck. So um, it was about really building our business at our back door. And when you live in a smaller town, 60,000 population, there are 13 pest control companies uh, in Mandra. Uh, so the competition's tough. Um, you need to be seen and to be seen we wanted to buy a second territory so that double our marketing double our visual uh, our visual impact on people and um, have less restrictions when it comes to advertising mm. that sounds like a good plan is it so is it yourself and your your wife work in the business or yeah uh, my wife was uh, in sales she's been in sales for the last 14 years um, mm. she just recently finished up her, her job of 14 years and she's come to work uh, alongside alongside myself in the business. So she's in control of um, the marketing, uh, making sure there's flyers and, you know, octopuses in, in every commercial building that is within our territory, um, calling on people, you know, obviously follow-ups through gyms, making sure that you are keeping touch with your clients um, you can't just go and do a job and then forget that they're your client because then you will forget that they're your client. You'll never see them again. So it's about looking after your existing clients, um, calling back lost leads. You know, is another thing people go, oh, it was a lost lead. What's the point? Um, I think we learned very quickly that by buying the second business and going through what were lost leads or non-converted leads, that there was a lot of area there where we could pick up more customers. So um, contacting those customers, offering them $50 voucher off their next pest control, letting them know that uh, 
Jim's is still in Mandra. It's still strong, healthy and running. Um, and just getting that visual appearance, that visual impact back into, into the area um, is exactly the same as when you're calling lost leads in your own territory. I've never heard any franchisees say that before. That's very interesting. So you contact previous lost leads and you, you offer them a voucher on the phone just saying you're still here or if you do decide in the future you need us. And how does that go for you overall? Um, look, you're not going to get a huge, it's, it's not going to be any, you know, huge percentage by any means. Um, we had a few uh, customers that stuck with the past franchisee who sent us quite a rude message back. Um, <laughs> but hey, yeah. that's what you get, you know. Um, I, I feel sorry for those guys standing in supermarkets in the middle of the, um, in the middle of the hallway every day and they're trying to approach people for, you know, charitable organisations mm. or whatever else and they, they must get, you know, terrible comments all day long. So I guess that kind of motivates me to go, hey, it happens to everybody. Um, but if you don't put yourself out there, you're never going to know. So it, it works really well. Um, <clears throat> since, since Roxanne started with us, to put it in a perspective of monetary-wise, um, since Roxanne started with us, she has generated enough uh, work out of doing this to pay her wages. Mm, that's great. Yeah, so, I mean, because we've gone from two incomes to one income, um, monitoring the income, monitoring money coming in to money, money going out is obviously a very important thing. Um, mm. So we need to work out a way. We knew it was going to be tough in the beginning. Uh, that's why we started doing this a month or six weeks ago, winter time, get prepared, get up and running, um, get a good system in place before summertime kicks off. That's our busy period. So we just wanted to make sure we had everything in place ready for summertime. Um, so we took we took a bit of a bite on income through winter to do that. And mm. now with what's actually occurred, I don't think we actually made too many steps backwards before we started breaking even and, and now we're starting to move forward. Mm, that's fantastic. Now, what do you like about your industry overall? So you've said you've got you started to develop an interest or a passion for it whilst you're doing the tape studies. So what do you like about your industry? What do you like about your, your business? Um, oh, I, I, I get a bit of a kick out of making my customers happy, actually. That's my favourite part is meeting my customers, having a talk to them, um, the phone ringing when they call you back to do another job, the review they leave. Um, that, that's my drive. That's what keeps me happy in my job. But the variety itself um, is fantastic. Self-employment, obviously, is fantastic. You know, I know when I start, I set my start time. I set my finish time. I'm a bit hard on myself. I'm my own worst enemy as far as that goes. Um, but I just love being in control of what I do every day, all day long. And I love, uh, I love my customers. The, it's fantastic when you get somebody who's got a concern that they don't know how to deal with and you go in there and you take care of that and, and you know, they're happy. They're, they're happy and they go, hey, give me some cards. Or, I've got some friends down the roads or, mm. or, you know, my family would, they've got a problem or, you know, it's that kind of stuff. I mean, never take for granted a small job or what it can turn into. That's, that's my theory. It's a great bit of advice and I love that. That's you never know what it can lead to. You never know what those people own or who they no. know as well. Exactly. That's, that's it. a great that's a great attitude. Yeah. End of leases are a classic example. You know, they they are um, on paper, they're a tenant. They're a tenant who is giving up a rental home and moving to another rental home. That's at least your first impression. But there's so many of those people who are giving up a rental because they bought their first home. Um, or because they're moving into their parents' home. Um, and then they turn around and go, oh, you know, look, can you come and do a spider treatment on this house? Or can you do a pre-purchase termite inspection? You know, and, and I've had a, a rodent baiting job, a $165 rodent baiting job turn into a $4,000 client, a regular, four, you know, $4,000 of income now. Um, I've got quite a few of those. One of them started with a, a wasp treatment for 150 bucks. Um, and I've done a, a termite inspection for this guy. I've done an ant treatment. I've done a spider treatment, and I did a chemical barrier for him. So he's turned 
you know, that's income of over $4,000 just off one person off a $150 job. So that's the big important thing is to never take for granted what that person is potentially going to uh, invest into your business. That's a great, it's a great comment and a great, we're going to clip that up, Kevin. That's perfect. That's what we want all you franchisees in training to know. But I was going to say, so what, with your services, what do you do? Because I had a look at your services before online. So can you tell customers and just tell people all the services that you guys do? Because I know there's a lot more than just, just simple termite treatments and stuff like that. Can you just go through a bit of a summary of the gamut of your services? Okay. Um, so the, the basic ones, the small ones, the, um, you know, by the time you take the lead fee out, um, you know, you're making 130 bucks maybe. And then you've got travel as well. So they're not the best jobs. But again, those are the customers that could be all of the other things I mentioned. So you don't take those customers for granted, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can, you know, make more money off them either. So you've got the rodent baiting jobs. Um, <clears throat> rodent baiting, it's important that we're using lockable bait stations because the lockable bait stations are what contain the bait, hold the bait, and in turn, you're not gonna hit off target species. So a rodent, I mean, the amount of times I get up into a roof and I find another pest control company's been in there and they've put a cardboard box with a hole in each end and a piece of bait sitting in the middle of it, just sitting there. Um, why put the cardboard box there? And why not just throw the bait in the roof? Because the rodent is going to grab that piece of bait and they're going to take it away and they're going to drop it outside. And a child is going to pick it up or a bird's going to pick it up or a cat or a dog's going to pick it up and then you're targeting off you know, non-target species. So keeping that bait contained in a box is one thing that I really assure my customers of because they're always worried about their children, their cats, their dogs, their, the birds. Um, you know, they're always worried about that kind of thing. So assuring that customer that the bait will be in a contained vessel where it is only going to target the problem species that they have at their home is, is a really good one. Um, it's not just a case of putting a bait station up there. It's about knowing your species, knowing how to treat them and knowing why you're treating them um, can turn what seems like a, a, a rodent baiting job into a science and customers love that. Mm. Um, then you've got the end of lease treatments. You know, an end of lease treatment, they, the first thing they ask is how much. Um, that's the last price. That's the last thing I give them on the phone. Uh, it's one of the few jobs that I do quote over the phone, but uh, that's the last thing that they will hear out of my mouth is how much it is. The first thing that they will hear is the real estate's requirements. Carpets need to be treated after they've been cleaned, minimum of two hours after they've been cleaned. One meter needs to be sprayed around the perimeter of the building around the outside. These are real estate's minimum requirements. So you need to inform the customer that there is a requirement there is a benchmark that needs to be set because otherwise <coughs> carpet cleaners say that they do fumigations as well for carpets, but they don't have uh, a pest control license to spray outside. So the amount of customers I've had, for instance, that said, oh, the carpet cleaner is going to do the carpets for fleas as well. Then you need to ask them, are they going to spray the outside of the building as well? And 99.9% .9 of the time they will, call you back and say no they're not actually right well then the real estate agent is not going to accept that invoice as being a fumigation treatment or a flea treatment because their requirements have not been met so that's the first thing you're teaching your customer is that there is a minimum standard um, it, we're not just going to spray some carpets the second thing that i do is i offer them a service that is convenient to them meaning it's a non-contact service. So I will tell my customer, look, if you're happy to go ahead with that, all you need, I will send you an invoice. On that invoice is a BSB and account number. Can you please pay that online? Send me a receipt, proof of, in, uh, proof, proof of payment. Then all you need to do is book in the date and leave a key at the premises. I will go in, do the treatment on the day that you've chosen, uh, Complete the, complete the treatment, leave the invoice with the key back in the meter box for you to collect at your convenience. So straight away, this person's gonna go, this is great, we're moving house, we've got this house that we don't care about anymore, we just wanna see the back of it, 
we've done the cleaning, we've done this, we've done that. Now we're moving into our new home. We're concentrated here. They don't want to meet you at that house for a 10 or 15 minute treatment. So you're supplying a service where you've explained to them what the real estate requires. You've explained to them the minimum standard of what needs to be done. You've made the job convenient and then you've given them a price. And 90% of the time, those leads are converted um, and they're in the diary. Mm, that's fantastic. Now I want to touch on real, sorry, you go. No, you carry on. I was just going to talk about, um, I want to touch on that termite and pest, the termite inspections. They're obviously pretty big for homeowners and, and things like that. Um, maybe do you want to touch on a bit about those? Because that, that's really, termite and pre-pest and pre-purchase and those type of inspections. Is that, is that something you do? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, do the biggest job, you know, smallest jobs, the biggest ones. Um, termite inspections, pre-purchase termite inspections. Uh, we have a good array of um, documentation for that. Um, through Formatize and through um, uh, Support Systems Australia, which is uh, our documenting company that supplies the, all of our documents to Formatize. So we have a good um, support system as far as what documents we use and they're up to Australian standards. So it's a really professional, um, good look to present to the client, which is the first thing, obviously. Um, the second thing is do, an inspection is not an inspection. Um, there are a lot of companies out there that will just do a visual inspection. So they'll walk around with their tablet and they'll tick and flick. Mm. Um, but that's not going to give the customer the peace of mind and the satisfaction that they want out of knowing that the house that they're about to purchase is in good shape. Um, so they're very important and it's very important that we understand that a lot of what we say or our, our report is going to have a huge sway on that customer as to whether they're going to purchase this property or not. So we need to take that very seriously. <clears throat> and to take that very seriously, we need to do a, a, a very good, thorough um, professional inspection. So uh, I purchased a, a Termitrack device uh, six months after I started. It was a huge investment to the company uh, and a huge, huge outlay, $4,000 for what is considered to be the latest technology in termite control. So it has a, a moisture meter reading, has a thermal reading, and it has a radar reading on it. So instead of, um, if there is an area in somebody's house that you have a concern in, uh, for instance, and you've seen that it's got some mold or it's got what seems to be like a depression in the timber, rather than get your pocket knife out and cut that area mm. open and make a big mess, um, this device can actually hear termites eating timber. So you can hold it against this beam um, and you can bring up the app on your phone and this machine will actually hear termites eating timber. Wow. So it's those types of things. It's that type of service that makes you stand out from the rest. Yeah, I was gonna uh, say, cause that's pretty important because I remember we said people, as you said, the tick and flick walk around with an iPad, just do a visual inspection only and that's it. And then give the report and then you know, let's say a year later, whatever they go, oh, you know, what, what happened here? Whereas you're saying, you know, you invested from the early days into that, that machine, which allows you to just do that. You know, it's not an invasive inspection almost, but you can get, you know, you can do what an invasive inspection would do, wouldn't, wouldn't you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that, that, the, the idea of this machine is strictly so that we don't have to do invasive inspections. Yeah. Um, you know, the professionalism of pest control is lifting and um, it's my intention to stay right at the top of the game uh, as far as keeping up with it. So um, same with moisture meter readings, the amount of people that it nearly, oh, I'm gonna say 90% of homes that I do termite inspections on have grout leaking in their shower boxes. Now that, that water is leaking through the grout into the wall, um, which is a conducive condition for termites. So not only will the paint and the plaster start to fall off the back sides, the back walls of those shower boxes, but it also releases moisture into the slab. Um, slab the slab is considered to be a porous surface, which, can, which will hold water, uh, which will accept water and hold water. Termites can sense the water through the slab, and then they are drawn to that area. So <coughs> keeping moisture out of a house is a huge um, bonus to keeping termites away. 
um, moisture is one of the biggest conducive conditions to attract termites um, into your home. So, um, you know, letting people know, hey, the, the grout started to leak in, and you take a photograph, you might find a tiny little crack in the grouting. You take a photograph of that, you take a photograph of your moisture meter readings, you put that into the report, you explain what area it's in and why it's occurring. And they go, this is fantastic. People want to know this kind of stuff. They, they don't know moisture's getting into their walls, mm. you know, um, but the effect that it can have over a long term is quite a financial um, burden to people. So, you know, for the sake of getting a shower box regrouted for $200 is fantastic as opposed to getting a whole wall replastered and painted. I think it's I'm fascinating um, listening to this sort of stuff because, as you said, most, most people wouldn't have any idea about this sort, of, this sort of thing until you make them aware and they'd be absolutely amazed uh, by the money you would save them by, by doing this. And I think more people should do it. So now let's talk about, so if you do find termites, let's say, at a, at a property, or let's say if it's a severe amount of termites, what's the next step? What happens then just from a pest control All right. perspective? So according to the training, um, so training comes first. So if you're not sure about something, go back to what you've learned. Um, you know, you're only going to build experience in, in every uh, aspect of the business by doing it and doing it repetitively and learning from the results of what you do. So the first thing that you do is you go back to uh, Australian standards. Everything that we learn through TAFE, all of the information that we've done, the whole units, the whole lot always keeps talking about Australian standards. What are the Australian standards? So the first point of call, if you find termites in a house, is are they treatable as in can we start a baiting system? Because Australian standards says that the first point of call with uh, any termite infestation should be to try and achieve colony elimination. So not just kill the termites that we find in a property, but kill the colony. And it's very difficult to tell. We only have subterranean termites here in WA. So it's very difficult to tell where those termites might be. They could be in a tree up to 100 metres away from where you find them. Termites can be up to 100 metres away from their colony. So to say, all right, let's go and have a jump over everybody's fence and check out their properties is not realistic. And, you know, generally you'll get bitten by a dog. So we're not <laughs> going to do that. Um, so the first point of call is if you've got a decent amount of termite activity in this area, um, we have to bait it. We start a baiting system. Now, some customers, if they've got termites in a tree out the back of their property and they're worried about their home, they might not necessarily want to start a $550 baiting system on a dead tree out the back of their block. Mm. That seems like a waste of money to them. So what you would do in a situation like that is you would offer them the opportunity to either protect their home. That would be obviously the first point of call to protect the home. Uh, me personally, I'm not too concerned about termites in a tree stump out the back of somebody's property. Termites are everywhere. Um, I can guarantee I could find termites in just about anybody's block um, if I looked hard enough. But that's not what we're trying to do. We're protecting homes, we're protecting investments. So the colony elimination doesn't only protect your customer's home, but when you explain to them that you'll protect their, by setting up this baiting system, you're protecting a lot of people in the same area, they kind of like that idea. You know, they, they kind of like the idea that, hey, I'm not only trying to, uh, termites are considered an extreme pest in WA. So that's why our minimum Australian standards is that we bait them, that we try and achieve colony elimination. So when you start up a baiting system, um, and it, it's it's a it's a big it's a big undertaking. It's four visits back to the client. It, you know, we have to achieve a minimum of one kilo of bait has to be taken by the colony before it's considered to be enough to destroy the colony. So it's not just a case of, hey, let's set up a bag of bait, let's screw a box to a tree and good luck and see how that goes. You know, it's, con it's constant monitoring um, and, and it, it's knowing the feeding of them, like the time of year. This time of year, termites are pretty quiet. They're, they're not really, they're eating out of the pantry just like we are. Uh, it's too cold, it's too wet outside, it's too, it's just not pleasant. So they're eating out of the pantry. And as the weather warms up, they're going to start 
replenishing that pantry again so they become more active. So doing a baiting system in winter time is generally not really as, uh, it's, it's not gonna take as well as it will in summertime because the activity of the termites is much, much lower. So whereas you might do a chemical treatment in winter time because you don't have an option, you can't start baiting, you would definitely start baiting in summertime over and above a chemical treatment. Mm. So, you know, those are the areas, that's, that's what we would do anyway if, if there was termites discovered on a property. Mm. Those are quite options a, we put to our customers. Yeah, it's quite a, it's quite a as you said, protect the mass, your most important investment, isn't it? So it's almost an essential for people if they've got any concerns to just have one done for peace of mind, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and, you know, look, again, it comes down to explanation to the customer. Like I said, um, you're not going to find too many people without explanation that want to go and set up a $550 baiting system on their tree. Um, mm. They would rather cut the tree down. So, so you, when you explain to them why and how that will work for them and, and how that will benefit them, then they start to understand, okay, th this makes sense. You know, um, and then obviously it's protecting the home as well. Um, mm. If there's termites on the block, the moment you change something with termite activity, if you've got a piece of timber where the termites are eating in your backyard, the moment you move that piece of timber away or you disrupt that piece of timber, you're going to send termites off in a different direction. So the question is always asked, what direction are they going to go in? Have a look around the block and ask yourself, if you were a termite, where would you be heading? generally it's the home mm. i was going to say with that knowledge because obviously you're demonstrating a lot of knowledge to that customer was that all acquired in the tafe period into those 30 days or how did you get that that knowledge level up yeah absolutely it is yeah um the hardest thing about tafe was me with for me was that i was actually doing tafe with a lot of big company employees that are getting their license mm. to be an employee for a big company and they were extremely disruptive in class. So, and I realized very quickly that the TAFE lecturer's hands were tied. He can't just stand up and go, come on guys, shut the hell up, mm. give everybody a fair go. So I kind of, I, I guess you could say it was a little bit rude, but I stood up and turned around to the class and I said to them, I'm building my own business here. I'm training for my business. I get one day a week, three hours a day to learn as much as I can learn in this industry before I have to go out and give my customers confidence in what I'm doing. So I asked them all, I said, if you can't invest that time to learn at the same time as everybody else, can you please leave so that we can? You know, if you don't care about this, then go away to, to allow people who do care about it to learn as much as they possibly can. Because everything that we learned at TAFE, we, as you can see, we take on to our business. Mm. And if you miss that opportunity to learn that, then you're going to be too busy to catch up, hopefully, or you're not going to be busy at all and you're going to go broke because you don't know what you're talking about. Mm. And let's talk about that 30 days. So the 30 days, is that where you have to get your jobs ticked off? Because I know you have to do a certain amount of jobs for various items. Yeah. Or how, what was in that 30 days? What did you do? So... Um, WA Health Department will send, uh, uh, so it provides a logbook to our franchisor who uh, provides that to us. And then we do 30 days one-on-one -on -one training with our franchisor if he is pest control. If he's, um, if he's not licensed as a pest controller, then obviously we go with somebody who is. Um, in our instance, my franchisor is a licensed pest controller. So uh, we do 30 days one-on-one -on -one, uh, training with him. So that involves going out and learning uh, about different types of termites. Um, we have three different types of termites here in WA generally, subterranean, um, finding out where they come, what habitat they live in, uh, why you'll find them there, um, things like that. So, and then termite inspections, it's just repetitive work. So one of the requirements was we had to spray our house 20 times with water. And this was to learn how to spray your house properly, how to make sure that you've covered every single area of your home so that when you go and spray a, a customer's home for spiders, you have confidence in what you've done. Um, for me, being a dairy farmer, it, it went hand in hand very well with pest control. 
as you can imagine, on a dairy farm, you have pests. Um, you know, you use a sprayer, you, you use herbicides, you use insecticides. So for me, it was a very natural thing for me to step into, probably more so than other guys that came from a different background. So I think what I learned was more interesting to me than perhaps uh, I did a, I did training with another bloke, put it this way. I did training with, there was two of us did training with our franchise or at the same time. The other guy kind of looked like he wanted to be somewhere else. And he is not a franchisor. He's not a franchisee with gyms anymore. So, I mean, you've got to look at, the writing was on the wall that he wasn't going to last before he even started because he just didn't care from the moment he started, mm. you know, and I think every franchisee needs to really take that on board. If you feel when you first start, like you just don't care, you may as well just throw your hands up and stop there because you're never going to make anything of it. I think it's a great bit of advice, Kevin. And that's why I've, I know Jim always says, you know, what are you passionate about? Everyone always goes, which one makes the most money, right? Well, it's more, what do you like doing or, what have you got an interest in and everything else will work itself out? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I saw that interview uh, with yourself and Jim and that, that question was interesting and I was kind of mm. sitting there waiting for that answer. And and when he, when he said basically um, it all comes down to the franchisee, uh, I totally agree. It's, you know, one person, I've, I've watched, franchisees who have been going for longer than me in the same industry fail and i'm watching franchisees who have just come on board uh who basically have the bare bones basic knowledge or still going to tafe and they're already showing signs of of being very successful into the future so it does really solely depend on um the person you know do you think it comes down to that passion or having that interest in, in, in the industry? Uh, look, I think it comes down, I think you create the passion by wanting to do the job, but also there's a level of professionalism there. If you want to make some good money, you've really got to sell the job, right? And mm -hmm. so there's that level of professionalism there. I can sell a job, for instance, if, if I, I can sell a job for $175 that I know people in the past couldn't sell for $100. What's the difference? <clears throat> so the job is exactly the same. The treatment that's been done is exactly the same. Why can one person sell it for 175 and the other person can't sell it for 100? And, and that's, that's that area that you need to take on and you really need to focus on. Mm. Um, yeah, that, yeah, and so there's that level of professionalism as well as the desire, like I, my biggest desire is I like watching my customers smile. I like watching them smile when they're paying me, you know, mm -hmm. and if you can make a customer smile when they're swiping their card on your FPOS machine, you've done a great job. Mm -hmm. I love how you associate that. And I think when doing this with a lot of franchisees, whether it be mowing franchisees, dog wash, termite and pest control, they say a similar thing. They like seeing the customer's reaction to the work. It doesn't matter what type of job it is. They love seeing the reaction for the customer gives them and the feedback and the reviews and stuff like that. And that sort of reinforces what they're doing and they want to go harder and harder and get better and better and better, which obviously yeah. you do. Yeah. So you've just done your first 12 months in business and you just bought another territory, which is fantastic in your first 12 months. What's your ultimate plans for your business? Let's say there's a three-year, five-year plan or what do you want to do? Do you want to have people on the road with you or how big do you want to go? Okay, so the, um, the second franchise was to um, secure territory in our backyard. Um, not because I consider the gyms, uh, other gyms guys to be competition towards me, mm. but only for marketing purposes um, because we had a little bit of difficulty when there was two territories in Mandra um, to be able to do enough marketing in our area without stepping on the other franchises. Yeah. Totally. So that was the main reason for that. Secondly is because, yeah, I absolutely, I tend to expand. Um, I'm in the processes of uh, doing a negotiation with a customer of mine, actually, to uh, secure a Toyota Hi-Ace van that she's had sitting on her driveway for five years. It's done 50,000 Ks. It's um, 
great vans, just got a bit of mold on it, needs a really <laughs> good clean up and a good polish up. Yeah. But it, you know, and um, so I'm doing a bit of a barter system with her to secure that vehicle. Once that vehicle's <laughs> secure, um, I'm going to set that up uh, the same as I've got my van. I use vans, I don't use utes. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to set that vehicle up as a second vehicle. My, my son is, uh, my youngest son is uh, currently in his fourth year of being a CNC uh, m apprentice. So he's going to finish his trade, which has always been our goal is that he finishes his trade. And then he's going to possibly look at um, doing some training with me to become a pest technician. And mm -hmm. so we'll just try and build a, a nice little family business. Um, to be honest, it has to be my son because right now, I don't think I would trust anybody else to do the work to the level that I want it to be done at. Mm. So uh, I think introducing just an employee into the business right now would be very detrimental to the business. And how are you finding your family life now? You were drive away driving trucks in the mines. Where, where were you in a super pit or something in Kalgoorlie or where were you? Uh, kind of. Um, so yeah. Western areas is, is about, uh, Four hours drive from uh, Karatha. Karatha, uh, yeah. Way out in the bush there kind of thing. Um, I've, I've always driven trucks. I've got my truck driver's license when I was 15 years old. I actually got an exemption um, to get my heavy vehicle license when I was 15 years old instead of waiting till I was 18 um, because I was working for a small family business where we were making hay and uh, you know, doing those types of products. And he basically went to the police and said to them, if this kid can't get his truck driver's license, I'm going to have to sack him and employ somebody else who can. And so through that avenue, I got an exemption to get my heavy vehicle license. So I had that from a very young age. Um, and that kind of worked side by side with my dairy farming background. Mm. Um, but driving trucks was never really something that, exhilarated me or excited me um but i enjoyed driving I, I like driving now i think after driving trucks for so many years it's been over 20 years um i don't i don't enjoy driving when we go somewhere i let my wife drive <laughs> just, I, i'm driving every day in yeah. in the van you know doing pest control so if i don't have to i, I don't drive anymore and so, how do you find the family time now you said you've got a son is it you got a one son is it or Oh, look, we've got, uh, between the two of us, we've got five kids. Um, the youngest two have just turned 21 a couple of months ago. So uh, we've got an adult family now, um, grandkids, um, quite a few grandkids around the show. Uh, so You're a young grandfather. Look like a yeah, young grandfather. I've got, I've got um, one, two, three. I've got three grandkids. Yep. And my wife, she's got... Um, She's got two, one, hmm. she's got one. So yeah, uh, you know, kids are growing up. When my oldest son's 27 years old um, and then I've got a 26, 25 year old daughter and a 21 year old son. So, um, and she's got a 25 year old son and a 21 year old daughter. So um, they're all growing up. Hmm. Mm. But yeah, family life's good. Uh, they, none of them will, Actually, two have just come home recently because they're doing FIFA and trying to buy houses and um, trying to save some money. So they're staying with us, but they're only, you know, two in one swing, so they're not home very often. Um, every, everything's kind of changed a lot since we started the business. When, when we started the business, all of the kids were living at home. I was FIFO. I was away a lot. Um, now we're at a situation a year later where all of the kids have moved out. Um, I'm home every day. And we're, we've got a gym termite pest control business. It's a pretty big, it's a pretty big 12 months for you, isn't it? As you said, you've gone yeah, from being yeah. five work, having kids at home, and now 12 months later, you've got your own, your own yeah. successful business. It's a pretty big change in 12 months, but it's a great thing to show anyone that you can change your, change your situation in a relatively short a bit of time to own your own successful business, which is quite impressive to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, look... Um, Marty said he wanted me to do this interview with you and I was kind of a little bit um, embarrassed about it, to be honest, because uh, everything that I do, I just, there's only one way to do it. Uh, I'd love to say there's more than one way to do everything, but there's really not. Uh, if you're going to take shortcuts, you, it's going to cost you money. 
um, one way or another. So there's really only one way to do anything. And that's what I said to Marnie, like when we bought this business, um, I think, you know, to be brutally honest, I think my franchise all would like to take a lot of credit for our success. Um, and maybe <laughs> yeah, I'll keep this in. That's, 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 a, that's a ripper. I've never heard that's a ripping line. <laughs> um, your success is solely based upon your own efforts and what you do. Um, mm. You know, you can have fantastic people all around you um, who are trying to teach you and, and, and guide you. But if you're not willing to accept that advice or, or put in your own efforts to, to be successful, then it doesn't matter how many intelligent uh, people you have around you, you're just always going to fail. So um, the buck stop, starts and stops with yourself. Um, I think that's a great, that's a great point though. And, that's, ex and that's, a, that's a fantastic point where people, let's say, buy a franchise or buy a business and just think it's all going to happen without putting in that hard graft or that hard work at all and just expect it and then blame someone else for their own if it fails, right? Whereas you've, you, you've acknowledged you've had a franchise or it can guide you and stuff like that, but you said at the end of the day, it's up to you and your attitude and how much you threw yourself into it. And it works hand in hand. So you do want to have a good franchise or it can help you and guide you in the right spot. But yourself, you're ultimately responsible for your own success, which you've done, which is fantastic. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I speak with my franchise or probably, oh, I'd say four or five times a week, really. Um, yeah, that's great. Yeah. With, yeah. Oh, and I think that's more me calling him than him calling me too, actually. But uh, <laughs> It's not uh, a proactive call. No. <laughs> yeah, look, you know, um, I, and I'm not too sure what we actually really talk about. Um, I think, you know, we're kind of almost mates. Um, he knows what I'm doing. So I, I've taken on the role of um, what Marnie called it a... Uh, so I'm the infield technical manager for Jim's Termite and Pest Control franchisees. So basically, um, I'm helping out Marnie with the training for new franchisees. Um, and That's great. So, 12 months into it, that's really good to be a trainer already. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, look, to be honest, I learned a lot from when I went through my training and I saw a lot of areas that could have been improved in. Um, and so... I wanted to help new guys to, to get the best possible start. Um, and I think that, you know, through dealing with them and having conversations with them now and doing a lot of training with them, I think that they are better pest controllers because of what I learned um, from not quite getting the, the possible training that I think we needed or as much of it um, or as much of the one-on-one -on -one time. So, I mean, franchisors are busy people. They have more than just, you know, one, one guy to worry about. Or, you know, in my franchisor's uh, situation, he has two divisions. So he's uh, building and pest control. Mm. So um, his attentions are very strained and, and spread out. So um, because Marnie and myself developed such a good relationship earlier on, um, and because I think... Um, I was able to learn probably more than previous guys who have started up um, only because a lot of it was natural to me, but a lot of it I really, really chased and I really wanted to know more. Um, and I think now that, that that's really working with the new guys too, their, their level of um, understanding in pest control is at a really good level once they're going live. Mm. And, That's fantastic. And, You've wanted to do that for, for, for the division or for the, for the area. That's really, really good. Um, well, well, I'm doing it for myself as much as I'm doing it for them because um, if they go out and they do a poor job and we get a poor rating on whether it be Google or, or yeah. whatever uh, avenue, then that reflects badly on me too. So um, I, I don't want them to be an embarrassment to me. <laughs> <laughs> hurt, yeah, well, the hurt, yeah, exactly. To hurt the online reputation is a, is a very good point. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so I've also given the, um, the new guys some work. Um, and I've told them, look, I've spoken to the customer. I've told them you're coming out there. I want you to take your time. I want you to use this house like a training zone and I, I don't care how long it takes. I, I want you to do the best possible job. <coughs> and they are, you know, they're taking that on. 
Um, they're doing a great job. So I'm really proud of the new guys that have started up and I'm really looking forward to having Jim's vehicles driving around everywhere, you know, like, yeah. It's really fantastic. To it. So I'm just taking up an hour of your time, Kevin. I know you've got a probably a busy day. So just before we go, is there any bit of advice or any sort of final sign-off you want to give to anyone who maybe 12 months ago might have been in a similar position to you? Any words of encouragement? Uh, yeah, look, all I'll give them is a bit of advice I got given to me by my franchise or is if you, if you can't run, walk, if you can't walk, crawl, just keep moving forward. And, and that means when you start, if you are not doing a job for a client, you should never be at home. Grab a bunch of flyers, grab a bunch of business cards, jump in your vehicle, get out there, be seen, market, 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 